going through high school, I found that like traditional academics wasn't so aligned with who I was. And what I was drawn to as a teenager was being in nature. In fact, when I was 14, I went on a three week outward bound backpacking trip that completely changed my life, being in nature for three weeks, sleeping under the stars. And so that deep connection with nature was with me through all my schooling. And I just didn't really find it in you know, the traditional schooling world. And so as I got through high school and started um, adventuring out into the woods and onto the coast with my friends, I really felt a need to live a life close to the land. And so as I'm a, you know, a young person, I'm 18 years old and I'm trying to learn about the world, I discover the issues of genetic engineering and uh, especially Monsanto and what was happening then was the Terminator seed technology, which is uh, genetically engineered plants that uh, produce sterile seeds. And if uh, this pollen gets out there into the world, um, it could decimate you know, the biosphere. So upon that awakening around kind of some of the perils of our, to, our, to our planet, um, my friends and I started an organization called Planting Earth Activation. And our goal was to plant community gardens all over Northern California with uh, the agreement being that we would put them in for free, but we would harvest 25% of um, the crop in seed to create a safety net, a seed bank for these communities. And one thing led to another, you know, it started with the seed and it started with community gardens and one thing led to another. Um, the local permaculture people in our region uh, kind of like saw these, you know, 20 to 30 teenagers and folks in the early 20s all like getting activated, took us under their wing and I took my very first permaculture course at the Oxford Arts and Ecology Center in 1999 and, uh, and I knew that that was life for me, that that, that, that that work of regenerating the land was something that was like a, a deep song inside me um, that I needed to sing and that having my hands in the ground was soothing to everything going on in my life and then to see the results you know that's the beautiful thing about building a garden or building a landscape or starting a farm is that you see results pretty fast you plant a strawberry patch and within a few weeks into spring you start harvesting and eating strawberries. So to have that back and forth relationship with the land to create abundance, to see degraded lots, because we would take um, asphalt covered lots and rip the asphalt up and turn them into gardens. We would take totally compacted, degraded landscapes and turn them into ecological landscapes. And to see how quickly the land responds and that this work anyone can do was so empowering for me that I knew that, that was my life path. And so I really basically dedicated my whole life to this since I was 18 uh, to, do, to do this work. And it's been very enriching to me and my family and also to our whole entire community. The Permaculture Skill Center is kind of like a culmination of what was about 15 years of experience in permaculture and activism and um, social entrepreneurship and realizing that, you know, honestly, there's a lot of gaps in this work, in the permaculture world, in the regenerative agriculture world. There's a lot of gaps. And when I say gaps, I mean, we haven't developed those robust career paths that folks can, that young people can immediately get trained into and have meaningful career potential with. So um, out of, uh, you know, in the 15 years before we started the Skill Center, I was running my own landscape company. I was teaching permaculture through PDCs and other short courses. And I just felt that the permaculture design certificate course was just, is, you know, too introductory, amazing for what it is, absolutely incredible for how it changes lives and empowers people and changes the lens that people see the world through. So I love them, but it, it's not enough. You know, it's just the starting point. It's just the springboard. It's the sprout of the seed. And so as I started to look into, well, what's out there for people after they take a PDC and how can folks step into a life path 
of regenerating the land. And what we notice is really not that much. Um, there's a lot more now, uh, and it's happening. And, and doing this work with Matt Powers and the whole community is incredible to see this groundswell of career training in the regenerative fields. And, and this, I think this is the future of our economy. But that's why we started the Permaculture Skill Center, because we wanted to develop a training system and an opportunity for folks of all ages to get the skills, not just the skills of building soil, not just the skills of harvesting water or planting food forests or enhancing habitat, but also the social skills, the organizing skills, the business skills, the communication skills, the facilitation skills, to be able to go out into our communities and create meaningful careers in healing the land. And you know, and the thing is, is it's different in every community. Like what works here in my community, the exact same model isn't necessarily going to work in your community. And, but the pattern of assessment, of assessing the landscape, of assessing the community, of assessing the issues or problems or gaps within a community are all the same. And the principles and patterns to develop solutions to problems ecologically, to bring people together, those are the same too. So it's really just like the tactics and techniques differ, but the strategy is the same. And we have seen amazing results from the students that have come through the Permaculture Skill Center or the people working for our various companies um, who are now making you know, a meaningful career by planting trees and building soil and catching water and connecting people to the land. So Permaculture Artisans is my landscape design contracting firm and uh, we started in 2006. And since then, we've grown to having over 15 employees, at times even more than that. Uh, everybody's getting paid a living wage. So success number one is that we've created a business that really honors the people inside the company. And uh, I mean, we have people working for permaculture artisans that have been with us over 10 years. The turnover rate is almost nil, right? Like, we have a loyalty and investment in each other and a strong community that we've created. So to me, like the social side of permaculture artisans has been hugely successful. The second part is, I'm gonna to stick to permaculture artisans for a second. The second part is we've worked on hundreds of projects throughout California, anywhere from sustainable forestry work, thinning fuel load uh, in, in congested, overgrown forest, reducing fire risk, and then taking all that material and turning it into carbon sponges. So getting it back into the ground as a carbon sequestration practice. We've worked in pastoral systems, hundreds of acres of pasture that have been, you know, taken over by invasive grasses, um, <laughs> not managed well, and helped bring in um, grazing management systems and tree planting agroforestry systems to help regenerate these pastoral environments. And then we've worked with schools and cities and counties and any number of private residences to completely transform their landscapes. We've put in public food forests um, at our Sebastopol City Hall and City Library. Um, we've put food forests in public parks food forests at schools. So, you know, the, the ripples and impact um, of just the basic work that we do with it, whether it's design or it's install installation or it's stewardship consultation uh, has had a really big impact on the land. And we haven't tracked all the numbers through the years, but I know that we have put in systems that are catching tens of millions of gallons of water every single year in drought-stricken California. We have planted thousands and thousands of trees throughout our bioregion, and all the benefits that trees bring of habitat and building soil and providing food and providing medicine. So just, to, just the work in of itself, I mean, in some ways it's so simple. It's so simple to plant a tree, right? I mean, we should all be planting trees every year, dozens of trees every year. Just, it's almost like our responsibility to plant trees. And maybe one of the most powerful acts we can do to heal the land. So that's some of the success of permaculture artisans. Now the Permaculture Skill Center is a very diverse system. 
we have one we have this uh, five acre demonstration site and on this demonstration site which is totally open to the public i mean one of our goals was we want to create a site that people don't have to travel way out into the woods to get to that is totally open to the public people could drop it anytime they want and we've been successful in doing that so it's been amazing people come through here all the time um, people from the bay area or people from around the world we have people from all over the planet come and visit here and they can go on self-guided tours they can meet the farmers they can have a picnic here so to create a demonstration that is totally accessible to the public was one of our goals and we've totally create uh, we've we've managed to do that the other thing is we have three farmers operating here on site. Uh, we have a flower farmer, we have a vegetable farmer, and a medicinal herb farmer. And to be able to offer space to farmers in this day and age, in this area of the world where land is so expensive, but people like to eat their organic food and they like their organic flowers and their organic medicines. But how do young farmers, new farmers, get access to land and water and resources and support. It could be a lonely endeavor. And so we've been able to provide an incubation site for farmers. Um, not only that, we also have a seasoned farmer here, uh, Katie Hatchemeyer of Red H Farm, and she's been a, a farmer for many, many years, and she already has you know, farmer's markets and restaurant accounts and everything. And we've been able to provide her a space to expand her operations, and she's also an educator and a teacher, and giving her a place where she can educate and teach people about food justice and about no-till farming. So what we've done is we've created this venue where all these different things are happening, where we have demonstrations of water harvesting, of food forests, of soil building, of mushroom cultivation, of pasture regeneration, of, uh, you know, all the physical stuff is demonstrated here. But then we have this social dynamic where we have multiple businesses, multiple farmers, all sharing resources, sharing tools, sharing the sun, sharing the water, sharing the space in a community-driven environment. And, uh, you know, it's not always easy. It takes communication and meetings and processing, but it's been very successful so far. So, so that's kind of like what the site has done for us. And then beyond that, our training programs at the Permaculture Skill Center have empowered hundreds of new farmers and new ecological landscapers that from all over the planet, we've had people from all over the planet come through here, come through our training programs and go back and start farms, regenerative farms, go back and start ecological landscape consultation businesses or design businesses or installation businesses. So we've created this, those training grounds for people to not only get the hands-on experience, right, that cellular experience of actually working the tools and having your hands in the soil, but also the community experience where we can provide feedback to each other, where we can practice presentation skills, where we can develop our design skills in a community environment and get feedback for that, right? So in our training programs, people are learning um, how to speak and market their services, um, uh, are building spreadsheets about their potential businesses and all the, what they, the resources they need and the services they're providing and how to bring all of that together. So we've really created an incubation center for people who want to step onto a regenerative career path. And then, you know, if we ripple out, we've also created all this opportunity for the experienced educators in our community because we invite everybody to the table to teach and train and be part of that educational system. So that's what I love to think that sometimes when we're thinking about permaculture and education, we focus a lot on the students as we should, but sometimes, <laughs> I notice our conversations around what we find important in permaculture education doesn't often include how important it is to support our elders and how important it is to support folks who have devoted their life to doing this work and give them venues and opportunities where they can share their experience and, uh, and support and train others. And often some of the most amazing farmers and technicians and herbalists and folks on the ground for 20, 30, 40, 50 years doing this work have never had that opportunity to share. 
and because they're maybe they're not on the internet a lot, you know, and they don't necessarily have all of the, the, the new age digital skills to share their knowledge. So we provide, we provide a, a, a place to bring those people together and give them a platform to, to share. The first step to creating a successful business is to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. And part of making that first step to start is that you can't listen to the voice in your head that tells you that you don't have enough experience, that tells you you don't have the capabilities, that tells you all the ways it's going to go wrong and all the things that are going to happen that you're going to fail. Because those thoughts are going to come in there in my head all the time. Any successful person in any industry is constantly dealing with those thoughts. So the very first thing you need to do is, is work here. Before you do anything out there, you have to work here. And part of what has allowed me to create a diverse set of in businesses and uh, enterprises is that I don't expect anything I do to be perfect. I don't try for perfection. I do the work and all the little failures that come along with doing it are like gems. They are, they are the key factor to tweaking and adjusting whatever project or endeavor I'm on to have success in the world. So you can't be afraid of feedback. You welcome feedback and start doing something. Just start doing something. You are going to learn as you go. But the beautiful thing about starting before you have all of the information or before you have everything in place is that as you learn the foundation for what you're building, whether it's a business or it's a project or it's a book you're writing, that the foundation for that grows as you learn. So you don't have to wait two, three, four, five years to learn all the skills to do something. You just have to start doing it. And within a year, you will have actually built something. And then you have to be ready to constantly adapt whatever you're doing constantly tweak whatever you're doing and be okay with that because just like we work with the land in the same way that we will have a conversation with the landscape uh, we'll, we'll maybe we're gonna dig a water harvesting swale or we're gonna build a terrace or we're going to plant a fruit tree and then that fruit tree dies or that terrace doesn't function correctly that's all a conversation we're having with the land and you make adjustments and you tweak and you keep receiving that feedback and integrating it. Same thing with building businesses and stacking enterprises is you use the same principles of permaculture to the design of your businesses. And that's why I've created more than one business. Because in a permaculture system, we would never just go out and monocrop a thousand acres, right? Like that's, that's not an ecological approach to working with the landscape. So the same thing in our enterprise development is that we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. We don't want to just do the one business and say that's the only thing because what happens is it starts to become an isolated system and it takes a lot of energy to, to prop up. But as soon as you create a sister company or project that can aid and fuel the first one like a guild, like a community, well then they start working together in harmony. And so what I've done over the past 10 years is I've developed five different enterprises. And each one of those enterprises is filling the niche that one of the other enterprises is needing, you know, is providing a service. For instance, a couple years ago with partners I started a mapping company called Foresight Mapping. It's a, we provide digital mapping services to the landscape industry. Well, I own a landscape contracting company. And Permaculture Artisans, my landscape company, we buy maps for our projects because we need nice digital maps in order to build our nice landscape designs upon. But we found that we were having difficulty with the other folks in our region providing those services because they, they, were, they weren't very service oriented or we weren't really getting what we wanted on the maps. And so we started a mapping company that now provides exactly what we feel we need to do good permaculture design to provide that baseline tool. 
So that's a great example. Another example is the Permaculture Skill Center. We have hired students straight out of our trainings right into our design firm because they proved, they proved themselves during, uh, you know, during the training program and they proved they have the passion and they were a good culture fit with our community uh, in order to do that. So every business is feeding and fueling the other one. And the more that we notice gaps in the community, um, problems that need to be solved in the community, we now have enough of a foundation between all these different enterprises that we can really make a change in not only in our bioregion, but in the whole world, because we've built a whole network of partners, a whole net, a whole community of staff, a whole community of different organizations that we work with. And the more that we work in collaboration with each other, not only just stacking the businesses, but also with other businesses like, um, like, you know, me working with Matt Powers and all of Matt Powers amazing work, um, the more that we harmonize with each other, we bring each other up. So it's, a, it's looking at the social entrepreneurial realm the same way we would look at the garden and constantly designing in those connection points and designing in those relationships. The other thing, and I'm going to give you the ninja trick now, okay? So here's my ninja trick. You ready? <laughs> the ninja trick to being able to constantly produce content and new businesses and put this work in the world is to align what you're doing with what makes you happy, with what feeds your soul. And I'll give you a tip of how I've been doing that these last couple years. And it's enabled me to write books, enabled me to build online courses, enabled me to write reports for clients, to write all kinds of, uh, policies for my staff and everything and that and it's this see for me what feeds my soul is to be in nature I need to be outside every single day I need to be walking through the wetlands or through the forest or walking on the coast I need to smell the ocean air that is that is what feeds my soul and I need to do that every day so how do I do that and be productive well what I decided a couple years ago was every business call that I had to take I would do it while I was hiking. So every single business call that I have to schedule, whether it's with a staff person or it's with a new partner or it's with a client, I go out to a trail that I know has cellular access and um, I make all my calls on the trail, every single one of them. And so I'm doing business, I'm being productive, I'm following through with what I need to do, um, but I'm, listening to the birds. I'm hugging huge oak trees. I'm, I'm, you know, checking the seeds on the grasses while I do that. And when I end that call, I can sit there in a peaceful place of nature and connect. So what I also do is I've learned how to dictate um, all my writing into my phone. So, you know, it's one of the benefits of that we have all this high technology and I'm not like, I don't want to be fully in technology all the time. I want to be outside, but the dictation software on my phone has enabled me to be outside and be productive at the same time. So I've learned really good dictation. So anytime that I want to write, I want to write a new book, I want to write a report, I need to write something for my, one of my businesses, it's an opportunity to go out and be in nature. Okay, I'm going to go to the coast and I'm going to go for a five mile hike on the coast and I'm going to write the rough draft of a chapter of one of my books. And as I'm out there on the coast, writing my chapter, I am constantly inspired. I'm constantly empowered. I'm constantly connected. And so the flow of what I'm thinking and writing is amazing. So then I take all that and I have to edit, you know, on my computer, but I'll take my laptop to the coast and I'll sit by the ocean and I'll work and do my editing while I'm out in nature. So for me, this is, uh, this is my life hack, and it's going to be different for everybody. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, for the productive work we need to do, what creative ways can we do the things we love and get the work done that we need to get done? Is it playing sports? Is it uh, uh, 
you know, being in community with others. What different ways can we do that? I'll give you one more example. Is I'm working on, uh, I'm, I'm letting you know something that won't be done for years. But I've been working on for the last couple of years a fantasy series um, that is a, a ecologically grounded fantasy series. I love fantasy. I read fantasy every day. And so I'm working on this series, but I'm going to take, I'm, I, my goal is in 10 years, maybe we'll launch the first couple books. So I'm in no rush at all to do this, right? <clears throat> so as we're developing characters and we're developing locations and we're developing plot themes, it's this incredible experience with my children. So my kids and I will hang out and we will just explore totally non-editing total non-editing brainstorm um, all these different ideas for characters and these different magical powers and different locations and different plot themes and different plot lines and I just capture it all and I'm not having even I don't even go back I just keep capturing 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 but so I want to spend meaningful time with my kids and this is a way that I've found that I can align a passion and a project and a goal and be with my children so the the, the thread of this whole theme is is to be creative, to discover what works for you, what kinds of soul nourishing activities can you do that also add to your productivity, that also move the needle a little farther along on a project or a little farther along on a business idea. So ultimately, if we're going to stack multiple businesses and develop a series of these kinds of ecological enterprises, it really comes down to people. It comes down to who you're working with and who you join forces with. And I've learned the hard way over the years about how challenging it can be to work with people. And I've discovered that it is okay to not be able to work with some people. It is totally okay, it's nobody's fault. But as soon as you realize that it is okay to, uh, that, that it is okay that some people you can't work with, even if they're people you love, even if they're friends, even if they're people you want to have some kind of relationship with, that you can have that relationship and not work. Um, once you come to terms with that, then you realize that there's a particular types of people that you can work with. And there's particular types of communication styles and work ethics and uh, relationship structures and business cultures that work for you and for your business. And so I learned that the hard way and what I've done is I've put together the most incredible team of designers, project managers, program managers, landscape technicians, foremen, business managers, my whole team. Every new person that we hire goes through a very strict vetting process. And I've, over the years, I've developed a process that I, is pretty foolproof to find that right match. And I've discovered that, you know, one thing we do in, perm in the permaculture regenerative world is that we often think that the only people we can hire onto our businesses are other permaculture regenerative people. And that's a mistake because we're isolating ourselves from the greater community that way. And what I've done is I look for the culture fit, the passion, the community orientation first, rather than the values. Values come second culture fit comes first. And when I say culture fit, I'm talking about communication style, I'm talking about work ethic, I'm talking about what do you do when it gets stressful? <laughs> How do you deal with stress? How do you deal with issues? How do you deal with problems? Because we are dedicated to having a positive work environment in all my businesses. And so how do you put a team like that together? And the way to do that is through a, a, a vetting process that really helps align you with the, the, the right people. So, so, that, so that's an important part of, of the puzzle, 
is building teams that can grow. And one of the key factors I've learned is that we need to bring people in that have a bigger vision, that have the long-term vision. If I bring someone on that isn't able to see the bigger, like where we're going in five years, where we're going in 10 years, then there's gonna be a lot of tension there because we're all working towards these bigger visions and, and they're gonna be tunnel vision stuck in some shorter time frame. So bring people on who can share the long-term vision. That is absolutely key. And the only way they can know what that is is if you communicate it, articulate it, and share it with them so that they can jump on the ship with you and away you go. The whole conversation about money and permaculture is a tricky one. And it's, it's fairly politicized in the permaculture community globally. And it's an important one to talk about because on one hand, you have a, a perspective that I would call a, the, the purest point of view, which is that, well, really we should all just go live on our own lands and grow our own food and catch our own water. And that having that small carbon footprint is the best possible ethical choice for anybody, for any permaculture person. Don't go out there and try to make money doing this work. Just do your thing on your land and your homestead. That's, that's one point of view. And I really admire folks who, who, who do this. I think it's a key model for how to, to be able to provide how we can live on the land ecologically, sustainably. But what it misses is the state of humanity right now on the planet. Because the truth is that whether we like it or not, the global economy has dominion over most people and most of the land. So while it's absolutely admirable and beautiful to go onto the land and homestead and live that pure life, it's a very, very privileged opportunity that is only available to a very small percentage of people. So if we say that per, that's part of permaculture, that that's one of the only roles of permaculture, then we have basically, in my mind, come to terms with allowing most of people to live in a degenerative world full of despair. Because if you go into cities, how many folks in cities born into those communities have access to land, can live a homestead or life? Hardly any of them, right? And because we live in a world now that is so dominated by this global economy, one of the only ways that we have today in this era to pull people out of poverty, to bring people back to the land, is to provide jobs doing that work, is to provide income opportunities for people to do that work. And so I believe that if we're talking about social equality and we're talking about regenerating the land, if, if we're not creating businesses that do this, then at this point in the experiment of humanity, we're dooming most people. So, so I just want to frame that first and foremost because I've seen how lives can be changed when somebody can spend 40 hours a week building soil and growing food and catching water and get paid to do that work that they can then take care of their family they can pay their rent they can you know go to the store if they need to they can get clothes for their children they can put send their children to school you know any number of basic needs that people have on planet today we, because the economy has dominated the planet, uh, people actually need money to do that. So I am 100% behind creating businesses that make money for people healing the land. And so one of the ways to do that is first, again, it's, it starts here. <laughs> it starts here with our framing because as soon as you start to look around the world and the landscape and see just how degraded the environment has become. How we've turned forests to deserts, how our roads affect water quality 
and soil, how our buildings and our developments affect the environment. As soon as you see the world through that lens, then one thing pops to the surface really fast, which is the question of, well, how do we mend our ecologies? How do we go about doing that? If we're losing hundreds of millions of tons of topsoil every year, if water crisis is exacerbating around the planet every single year, if food shortages are exacerbating around the planet every single year, if arable land is disappearing at an alarming rate every single year, what that leads me to is this view of, well, what if we shifted our focus our economic focus is from extraction to regeneration. What if we made that shift? What if we made that the focus of our economic endeavors, our services, our products, our businesses that we put together, the way that we work in community? What if it was all driven by restoring the landscape? And so when I look at that, I see in, at this point an infinite amount of potential business opportunities for people to grow livelihoods while restoring the planet. And so first you have to identify what the problems are in the community. And then you can build solutions around that. And that's how you make a viable business. Any viable business can tell you the same thing, whether it's an ecological lens or not an ecological lens. Every business, you know, every business coach, the very, one, one of the very first things you do is you identify where, what the problems are in your community or in your market or whatever demographic you're providing for, what are the problems, what are the issues, and that you are now providing the solution to those problems and to those issues. So the reason why this is such an important starting point to make a business that works is because if you just think, you're just like, oh my gosh, I just think this is a great solution or this is something I wanna do, but there's actually not a market for it, in your community like no one else thinks that only you think it you had some dream and you wake up and you're like i'm gonna make i'm gonna sell uh you know calendula blossoms at the store because i think everybody wants to eat flowers on their salads and so i'm gonna grow that i mean that might be a viable that might be a viable farm business for some people but are you living in a community where people even have ever eaten an edible flower um, would want to eat a flower, maybe you'd have to do education first. And so, so you know, I'm, I'm bringing this point up that you really want to take the time to identify the problems and issues in the community that you're trying to serve first and foremost, and then develop a business that provides solutions to those. So that's step one. Step two is honor yourself. Honor yourself. Because if you don't honor the time and the passion and the energy that you have to provide these solutions to your community, and you give it all away for free, or you enter into conversations with potential clients or potential business partners with very, very low confidence, because you think, well, I really shouldn't be here. I don't really have the experience or the know-how or blah, blah, blah. I just have this idea and they probably don't want to work with me. If that's your mind frame going into your relationship building as you develop a network, well, people are going to pick up on that and they're going to think, oh, maybe they're not really someone I want to work with. So you have to work in here on your confidence and know that even if you don't have all the experience in the world, that having the passion to work hard and to learn is enough. Like that's worth a lot. That is worth a ton. So that's one piece. Another piece is, and this is what I teach to all my students in my Eco Landscape Mastery School, is create a social engagement plan. So the way to build a business these days and for a long time is you want to give something first. You want to provide some kind of value to the community. And when the community sees what incredible value you're providing, they want to learn more about you. They want to work more with you. So come up with a social engagement plan. So what a social engagement plan is, is it's where you, where now you are donating some of your time. You know, you are giving something to support uh, something in the community. Maybe it's a school, maybe it's a community garden, maybe it's a, an issue with the city, maybe it's providing a solution to a particular demographic of people that are suffering. Whatever it might be, maybe it's children, maybe it's high schoolers, whatever it might be, 
uh, provide some way to give some of that love, you know, to either through education or through a special work day or a free consultation. Or one of the things that I've done for years is I'll do free design work. So I'll notice a community that has a project, let's say a school, and they want to create a school garden, but they don't really have the budget and it's a, like a long process and stuff. So I'll show up to the meetings. I'll support the conversation. I'll give them advice and then I'll even design the whole thing for them uh, or parts of it and help the community work towards approving a particular project. And this kind of giving, um, this kind of social engagement where people see you as a, an asset to the community, whether they're paying you or not, it develops a, a strong social capital in your community. And that's one thing that I've personally worked on my whole adult life is developing strong social capital with other organizations, with cities, counties, schools, other people. And I would say that that is my number one reason for any success we've had has all been because of the social capital that we've developed with um, with our community and every year I find another like pet project that I give some of my time and energy to something I'm passionate about or um, recently we had a firestorm hit our community and Many of us have rallied together to help in the remediation process and, and in the education process around fire ecology. And that is valuable. People see that and they want more. And so that kind of social capital can be a real strong foundation to be able to have a successful business. And know that any new project, any new business is going to take some time before it's really a sound business before it's really successful. So the other part about dealing with what's in here is knowing that in that first year, you're probably going to fail a bit. <laughs> you are probably, you may not make much money. You uh, may, your projects may not go the way you thought they were going to go. Um, and so what you have to do is not give up. You cannot give up because something doesn't go the way you thought it was in year one, and in year two, you can't give up, and in year three, you can't give up, and essentially, just never give up. But always accept feedback, always adapt, always tweak what you're doing to actually be providing solutions that people are looking for. Because um, the more that you can get that information, that feedback from your community to understand where people are struggling, so that you can develop solutions to those struggles, the more viable your business is. You'll actually have a real business. And I like to say it probably takes about five years to actually have a business that can kind of run on its own. And that's what it took for my first business, Permaculture Artisans. It was about five years of, you know, just cl from going from client to client and some months being like, oh my gosh, are we going to be able to keep our two people employed this month? And what are we going to do? And, you know, it, it, and you learn a lot and it can be a struggle. But if you're willing to put that time in, if you're really passionate and dedicated to your mission to, to do this work, then it's going to be worth seeing through all those changes and all those little failures. And at about year five, you're probably going to see things have settled in. You have a very clear idea of the services you're providing or product you're offering and what that product is or services. You have a very clear idea of the community and what they need and you're providing that for them. And you have enough of relationships through your social engagement plan, enough social capital, enough connections in the community that people readily trust you. Because trust is really what it comes down to in the end, is that people have to trust you to want to buy anything from you. And you develop that trust by being authentic, by giving, and by building relationships with your community. Well, to learn about our whole community, our whole guild of business enterprises, uh, we could go to ericolson.com, is a, where I have a link to all of my different businesses there. And then you know, they all have their own websites and, and everything. Um, so I do have a gift for everybody here today. Uh, if folks are feeling like they want to step on that path to starting a career in regenerating the land, 
I've put together a free three-part training on how to become a professional ecological landscaper. And what's so awesome about ecological landscaping as a profession is that it's really diverse in terms of the kinds of work you can do. Like you could be an ecological designer, landscape designer, and you could be focused on community gardens. You could be focused on school gardens, or you could be focused on perennial systems where you're planting trees and planting herbaceous perennials and and or you could be incorporating animals into a system. You could be designing farms. You could be designing business campuses. You could be designing public spaces. So what's amazing about the whole umbrella of ecological landscaping is that you're not really siloed into just one thing or another. You have a diversity of different uh, things that you can do, different ways that you can apply yourself, all depending on your life, on your context, where you live, what the problems in your community are that you're solving, the issues in the ecology or environment. Ecological landscaping can really touch on so many factors in our community, in, in our landscapes, but you can actually provide it as a service. Um, and a couple years ago, I was looking into the United States census records and discovered that the landscaping industry in the United States is over $72 billion a year. And I always bring this up because if you think about what is that $72 billion a year, just in the United States, what is it really funding in terms of landscaping? And if you look around at most traditional landscapes, it's lawns that use an excessive amount of water. It's non-useful ornamental plantings that aren't providing food or habitat or any kinds of other functions. So, but people like their beauty. Everybody likes to have some kind of landscape. You know, we, we all developers are landscaping around their new developments. Um, every house has some kind of landscape around them. So all of these little micro properties, if you added them all up, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of acres of land and landscaping as a land use industry in the Western world is mainly extractive and it's mainly degenerative on water and soil and ecologies. But in ecological landscaping, we can make the land beautiful. We can give that connection that people want to the landscape. We can provide all the basic needs that anybody wants in a landscape, but we can do it in a way that builds soil, catches water, grows food, enhances habitat, and connects people back to nature. So, so go ahead and take my free training um, and go through the three-part video uh, series and see if it's a good fit for you. And, and, and hopefully today and in the future trainings, you, know, you, you feel some of that inspiration and empowerment to get out there and make a career doing this work for yourself.
Are you stuck? Are you caught in a situation where you feel like it's a, it's a dead end or you're about to hit a wall? That's where I was. That's what I felt. I was going to go into bankruptcy. I kept going deeper and deeper into debt. But it was permaculture. It started with growing my own food. It started with saving water. Permaculture was the pathway for me. And I can tell you, there is a path in permaculture to the regenerative future waiting for you. That's why I created the Advanced Permaculture Student Online with over 70 different educators from around the world to showcase what's possible, to teach you how to apply the principles, the frameworks, the ethics of permaculture in action so that you can transform the world around you by partnering with nature, the strongest force in the world. I'm so excited for you to dive into this. I'm Matt Powers, grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And click the link below because there is a regenerative future waiting for you. It's actually a pretty exciting time to be a farmer or a consumer of produce. There's new beans, new peppers, new corn, new everything's coming out. Um, tomatoes have changed more in the last 10 years than they have on their whole existence on the planet. With rainwater harvesting and you can reuse it through gray water and you can grow soil and grow plants and fruits and vegetables and have healthy, nutritious existences. Are nothing, but this is a byproduct from fermentation. Those ATPs are full of fuel and energy that then get contributed back into the carbon structure. Every teaspoon, every quarter teaspoon of soil has 2,000 micrograms, on average in general, 2,000 micrograms of nitrogen, all of which can be pulled out. Not only just stacking the businesses, but also with other businesses, like, um, like you know, me working with Matt Powers and all of Matt Powers' amazing work. Um, the more that we harmonize with each other, we bring each other up. And I was amazed it was possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. You could rehydrate dehydrated biomes. You could revegetate areas which had lost all their vegetation. The hemp seed is the superfood that requires an actual cape. It's really one of the first of its kind in Southern California. The carbon footprint on these mechanisms and the making and the use of biochar is three to one negative. Keeper can do anything. You can digest animal products with Keeper. You can digest um, human products, plastics, whatever. You can digest anything if you know how to do it. And if you know what, the, what, the, what microbes are doing what and how to stimulate them to do it, then they can do it for you. They're superheroes. What's this golden potion that my grandfather's pouring people? Mead, when you pour it, is a cup of bubbly gold. So I always try to encourage people to learn as much as they can about how bees live without a beekeeper and then try to make decisions from that point. The idea that they can take something through this bacteria in their gut and bring it full circle. You go to the store and you're paying your money for food. Um, I just open the back door and come out and go shopping. Permaculture is a doorway to an extraordinary life. It's an opportunity to a regenerative future, one filled with hope and inspiration and joy and growth and syntropy. There's no prerequisites for this course. This course is designed to include a PDC and go way beyond. This course partners with over 60 different teachers and organizations from all over the world. And we are teaching people how to live regeneratively, how to start their business in the regenerative economy how to plan for a future that for many people is completely uncertain, everyone's afraid and scared. This is where the change begins. It starts with finding the path towards hope, towards regeneration. You've waited long enough. This, the time has come for this. The regenerative economy, the stepping stones to that future are here. And this course is one of those very critical stones that you know is the step between K through 12 regenerative education and the regenerative economy. So join us. The future is amazing. The future is beautiful. And the future is waiting for you.